Shabbat Shalom. You know, I have to confess to you that sometimes I feel uh, kind of guilty being here. Because you know who's really blessed are the teachers. Because we have this opportunity, you know, to go into the scriptures and to navigate and to, to see great things. And of course, we, we bring them to you. But sometimes I, I study the word and find something and I just stop. Stop for maybe five minutes in prayer and to see the beauty of it. And today we're going to look at a great passage, a very clear passage, one that speaks about the salvation, salvation that we all need, salvation that many of us have. So if you have your scriptures, you can open up to Luke chapter 1. We're still there. This is the fourth week in this chapter. I want to tell you that first the, the Christmas season is fast approaching, right? And this time, and even now, represents for us a great opportunity to share the good news. The news about the birth of the Messiah, about the reasons why he came down to earth, and the great blessings he gives to those who commit their lives to him. It is a great occasion to remind the world whose birthday it is. You know that Jesus is seldom considered at Christmas, and I believe it is our duty even in these times, to remind the people for their own benefit to see what Jesus did for them. You know, as far as the, the scripture says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, it tells us to preach the word, to be ready in season and out of season, to convince, to rebuke, to exhort with all suffering and teaching. And this coming season is an ideal time to speak of him because this world has committed this time for him. And it is up to us to grab it and to turn it into a blessing for them. You know, during the year, we pray for doors to open up so we can preach, we can evangelize. Here, the doors are opening up by themselves, and we need to realize the great prospect we have in doing the work we are assigned to, that is, to evangelize. Hanukkah is also coming, and at the same time, this also is a great opportunity to speak to both Jews and Gentiles. Did you know that there's a strong connection between these two feasts? Both speaks of the first coming of the Messiah and the preparation of the land and the temple for his first appearance. And Hanukkah should not be foreign to Christians. It is mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter 10. At this time, we see Jesus at the temple, and surely, at, like all Jews at the time, he was celebrating this feast. We will look at this feast in mid-December. But I want, you to, I want to encourage you to take hold of this great opportunity of Christmas, Hanukkah, to pray and to share the word with those that you know that do not believe in the Messiah. I want to tell you the best gift you can give someone for Christmas is to lead them to God so that they may receive the gift of salvation from him. And today's subject in the Gospel of Luke speaks precisely of this time of preparation for the coming Messiah. We are right before his birth at the season and the, as the season of miracles and wonders have returned to Israel. And it already began. All started, as we have seen, with the word of God coming to a priest Named Zacharias, this was a first after a long period of 400 years. Then began the miracles ushering the coming Messiah, two pregnancies. One of a faithful lady named Elizabeth, who was very advanced in age, but became pregnant because God had promised it. Her son, John the Baptist, was to prepare the way of the Messiah. The other, the greater miracle, is that of a young virgin who became with child, the Messiah. A great and necessary miracle because the one who was to be born must have been born this way for two reasons. First, because he is human and needed to be born of a woman so he could live in such a way as to satisfy the demands of God for holiness. Something no man could do, could ever do. Because God's demands are way too high for any simple human to fulfill. Yeshua came so he could live in such a way as to fulfill the demands of the law for us, which he did, and which made him suitable to die instead of us as a substitute so that we may have eternal life. This, by the way, is the story of redemption. This is the story of Christmas. All this was done already, and today all one needs to do is to acknowledge and accept this fact. Do you believe that there was a virgin birth? 
all began with this miracle. Do you believe that Jesus came from heaven and died for your sins? Do you believe you are a sinner? All begins here as well. And all of this is at the base of biblical Christianity, of the biblical Christianity faith. The second reason the Messiah must have been born this way is because he is divine. He was not born like you and me. He is not a man that became God. This is a great fallacy that stems back from the first sin, from the first lie. The sin that came directly from the mouth of the serpent when he said to Eve that if she ate the fruit, she says, he says to her, you shall be like God in Genesis 3.5. She did eat the fruit. What happened then? Has Eve turned out to be like God? That was the lie. The lie continues even today, and it keeps on luring people away from God. Eve's condition worsened. But the one who was born needed to be born of a virgin, so our sinful condition would not affect him. So he would be free from our sin nature. This also was necessary so that he may die for each one of us. The virgin birth is one of the greatest acts of grace from God, and one that can only be believed by faith, because it is astonishing, it is extraordinary. It may be foolishness to others, but to us it is the power, the grace, the love of God in action, and is right at the announcement of the birth of the Messiah that we are right now in the Gospel of Luke. You can go to chapter 1 again, and let's read verses 26 to 33 and see how it flows, how clear it is, because when it comes to salvation, the Lord made it so clear for everyone so they may come to him. Verses 23 to 26 to 33. It says, Now in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, the virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Here we are introduced to the mother of the Messiah, Mary. So much was said, and so much was written about her. When it is about Mary, people tend to go to one of two extremes. They either magnify her, worship her, or they just ignore her. As if the two camps feed each other. One overdoes what the other doesn't do at all. But there is much we can learn from her. And but we need to salvage this young Jewish girl from both extremes and see how the Bible beautifully portrays her. Have you heard of the story when once the devil was walking along with one of his cohorts? They saw a man ahead of them picking up something shiny. What did he find? asked the cohort. A piece of truth, the devil replied. Doesn't it bother you he found a piece of truth? asked the cohort. No, said the devil. I will see that he makes a religion out of it or that he forgets about it completely. And this is true not only of Mary but of so many things that we see in the scriptures. This is why we constantly need to go back to the ancient path, like Jeremiah says, to the origin of the truth, which is the Word of God, which is the Bible that you have in your hands. And notice the first words that the angel Gabriel tells Mary. This will help us to situate Mary. The first words are rejoice, highly favored one. Here there is a repetition of the same word in the Greek, but in different form, something that is not reflected in your translations. These words could be read like, read like this. It says, grace unto you, you highly graced. Both the words rejoiced and favored are of the same root charis, meaning grace. And the angel tells Mary that she is doubly graced. But what does grace mean in the biblical frame? 
Grace is unmerited favor. It means that the action is undeserved. It is something that cannot be earned. Grace is a gift from God. It has nothing to do with works. And when it is used in the New Testament and in the Hebrew scriptures, this word is set forth, it sets forth the grace of God in the salvation of sinners. From Adam to the last person on, on earth, grace is that thing that flicks them to God. Grace is a gift. The closest synonym, by the way, we can find in the scriptures is a favor. A favor. And here it is given to Mary twice. So to show us that she is in need of grace, just like any other human being. So to show us that she is not divine. As a person, Mary was in need of grace and she received it. As all others in the Bible except the Messiah, she was chosen by grace. In fact, she herself agrees that she needed a savior. Look at verse 47, where she plainly says, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my savior. Who needs a savior? Sinners need saviors. Would you worship a sinner? The Bible forbids it. Once we pass this wall of partition, a wall that casts a dark shadow on this great young woman, once we give her her right place, then we can really appreciate her because she truly is a great person. And so the first words of Gabriel help us to see who she really is, a woman chosen by grace. This is a good start. Because this woman was giving such a gift that, and we are so prone to idolize that we need to realize what are these first words. This world also, highly favored, also occurs in Ephesians 1.6. And there it speaks of the body of the Messiah. It speaks of all other believers. And show that to us, like Mary, we were chosen by grace. This is the starting point. Grace for all men and women. It's always been like this. Grace chosen by grace. And Gabriel further tells, tells her, The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. To be blessed is really to receive special favor from God. That was what the blessing implies. And what a blessing this woman received. One that cannot be duplicated. She was to be the mother of Jesus. One woman could only receive this blessing, and she did. You know, the last phrase may not appear in your translations. Blessed are you among women, but it is in all translations in verse 42. And this is where the great announcement is given. Finally, after so long, verse 41 reveals something new. Look what it says. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. The child will have a saving name. Jesus, Yeshua, means salvation. This child was to be the savior, not one savior, but one, the one and only savior. And what is he saving us from? Matthew gives us more information and reports what Gabriel further said to Mary. He said in Matthew 1.21, we read that his name will be Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Here we find bi biblical Christianity 101. In fact, which is at the base of all other doctrines in the scriptures, the Messiah is the savior of the world. The Messiah came to save the world. And what does that imply that he saves us from our sins? What does the word sin actually mean to you? You know, so much is implied in this small word. Sin implies judgment, for instance. As in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, it would say that Jesus would deliver us from the wrath to come. Because sin leads to death, leads to wrath. But Jesus came to pull us out of it. Sin implies pride. Sin implies self-exaltation. Galatians 2.20 tell us that Jesus came to save us from ourselves as well. There Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. It's a process. He came to save us from the I, which, means, which always tells us that we can make it apart from God. That also is a lie. We need God. 
We read in Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Going to God is freedom. Freedom. It's not the opposite. We think the opposite. We think that God comes and disturbs our freedom. But true freedom is when you are with God. The eye is to be crucified with the Messiah, that the body of sin might be destroyed. This is the teaching of Paul. Self-wisdom, self-effort, self-righteousness, all our enemies from which we need to be delivered and from which we are saved when Jesus reigns in us. You know, we have our, our own personal civil war going on as we are at war, at war with three people. You know who they are? The me, myself, and I. You're right. And I want to tell you, none of them can get along with each other. And this is due to sin. Yeshua, I want to tell you, came to restore peace in us. Sin is also rampant in this world. We have to realize that. And he came to save us from this present evil world. We read in Galatians 1.14 that he gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of God and Father. This is what is implied and much more in the salvation we have in this name, Jesus, Yeshua. By the way, I, I, I'm amazed to see how easy it is. You know, I'm amazed to see that there's so many difficult passages in the scriptures when it comes to salvation. It's clear. It's there. And what kind of man is the Savior? How is the Savior going to be? See the first words of verse 32. He shall be great. Yeshua is great in all that he is. He is great in his origin, for the verse says that he will be called the son of the highest. Even though he will be born of a woman, his origin is from eternity. He is God. He is God coming into a flesh. He is great because he is the son of the highest. And this is a fulfillment, I want to tell you, of this great prophecy of the coming of the Messiah that we find in Isaiah 9.6. It says, for unto us a child is born and a son is given. And who is this child? Who is this son? said his name will be called Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Can you do that? Can you actually call a, a human child Mighty God, Everlasting Father? From the highest in heaven, he is the greatest of men. He is all that. This child is really the Mighty God. This son is really the Everlasting Father. All these things are implied in the words he will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. For in him, it says in Colossians 2.9, dwells all the fullness of the godness, Godhead bodily as we see it in this passage. He is completely God. He will be great, and yes, he is the greatest, and he will be the greatest for eternity. He is great in everything, and especially in that, he died for me. I just want to tell you that if you were the only person on this earth, he would do the same thing. He would do the same thing going on the cross just for you. And see the rest of the verse in verse 33. It says, and the Lord will give him the throne of his father David. And verse 33 says, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. I want to tell you this is another truth that slipped out of our hands. Has Jesus ever sat on the throne of David? Have you seen that in history? Has he ever reigned from Jerusalem? Has he ever ruled this planet? Many today spiritualize this verse and say that Jesus is now sitting on his throne in heaven and this is the throne of David. This, I want to tell you, is giving too much to David. Jesus did not come to typify David. It is the opposite. David has an earthly throne, not a heavenly one. And besides which, Jesus is not sitting as a king now. What is he sitting as? As our priest. Second, if one spiritualized this verse, why then not spiritualize the preceding ones that speak of the virgin birth? Why change suddenly? We need to be consistent in our reading of the scriptures. If one is literally true, the other is also and what is really the throne of David? 
This is when Jesus will come down to earth and establish his kingdom here. This is something that was prophesied from the beginning and is here confirmed by Gabriel. It will be confirmed by Mary and by Zachariah and by Paul and by Peter and all the others. And today especially we can see the need of such a leader. The throne of David speaks of the eternal state. When the new heaven and the new earth will be created and the new Jerusalem will come down from heaven and be placed in the sight of the earthly Jerusalem. And the Bible says, in Revelation 21, 3, it says, God himself will be with them and be their God. We're going to live with him. The messianic times are here implied as well. But ultimately, it refers to his eternal reign from Jerusalem when sin will be put away. And so the kingdom of David implies that Israel will be reestablished. And we see one more time that Mary, like Israel, both suffered in the hands of tradition and hearsay. Both are here magnified. They're either here magnified beyond measure or they're just ne neglected or even worse. They're hated. Both need to be salvaged and put in their right place because there's so much we can learn from, from them. And it is here that Mary asks the angel, how could this miracle occur since She's not married, right? Look at verse 34. It says, how can this be since I do not know a man? Now, and like Zacharias' question before, Mary did not argue the validity of the words of Gabriel. She only wanted to know how these things were going to happen since she was a virgin. Her question did not stem out of unbelief, as that of Zacharias. Both questions, I want to tell you, are different. Zachariah said in verse 18, how shall I know this? Or how shall I know it's really the truth you're telling me, Gabriel? That's in verse 18. It had to do with knowledge, accepting or believing. This is why Gabriel told Zacharias in verse 20, you did not believe my words. And as a consequence, he became mute for nine months. But now notice how and what Mary responds to Gabriel. Look at verse 38. Look what she responds to him after she heard the explanation. She says, Behold, the maid servant of the Lord, let it be according to your word. Let it be to me according to your word. This, I want to tell you, is true faith. She believed and she let it in the hands of God. Yet, and this is very important, much more than Zacharias, she had plenty of questions she could have asked. Because the very fact that Mary was to become pregnant before marriage would change her life and really put her in danger within her community. For one thing, she had to trust God concerning the reaction, the reaction of the community. For she was in danger of being expulsed, of being ostracized for the rest of her life. At the time, a girl that became pregnant before marriage could, according to the law of Moses, be lapidated, that is, killed by stoning. This is how much in danger she was. And we know that some people, even after concluded that Mary had been unfaithful to Joseph, we can see this in John 8.41, when the Pharisees told Jesus, you were born in fornication. And even today, you know, Mary could have panicked. But Mary did not seem to be disturbed by these things. Why? Because she had complete faith in God. She remitted her future in the hands of God. Do you see the power of her faith? You know, God knows who to choose. Second, she also had to trust the Lord concerning her relationship with Joseph. She was engaged. This was a valid concern because Joseph, we read, being a righteous smith, Men did contemplate divorcing Mary in light of her pregnancy. This you can see in the book of Matthew. She did not say to the angel, what would the people think, right? She did not say to the angel, hey, don't forget to tell Joseph because he's going to panic himself, right? She completely relied on the Lord. See how faithful a woman she was. What application, by the way, can we draw so far from this young Jewish girl who was faced with such an extraordinary experience. 
The first question we may ask, do you trust God with your future? Is his will part of your decision making? The reason why today we still speak of this young girl is because she trusted God with her life. She believed and her belief did not fall from the sky as we will get to know her better. We will find, we'll find out that she worked out her beliefs. She knew God. She was very acquainted with the scriptures. And we'll see in her prayer called the Magnifica that she knew very well the scriptures. There must have lied her secret of such a great faith. She learned to know God. She learned to know God as he is revealed in the scriptures as he revealed himself in the Bible, and she surrounded herself completely to him. This is why she is so blessed. And this is what we need to do with our lives. We need to surrender, to let go, and let God act in us. We need to know what offends God and not do it. We need to know what separates us from him. We need to know him and begin to be like him in his love and his holiness. And what is that thing, by the way, that stops us from fully working with God? Sin. By the way, this is the reason of Christmas, right? Sin. In his book, I Surrender, Patrick Morley speaks of a general misconception within the believers. And I quote, he says, that we can add Christ to our lives, but not subtract sin. It is a change in belief without a change in behavior. And he goes on to say, it is a revival without reformation, without repentance. You know, many are living this type of life. This is why they don't see the blessings in their lives. But I want to tell you, this is not the life that God has designed for you. This type of life without God is a life of struggle over struggle. You know, do you remember Jacob? Do you remember that he fought God? And his struggle with God really became symbolic of the one we are always, often engaged against God. Let me read to you Genesis 32, 25 and 32. Here I want to show you how God won the battle. What, he did, what did he do to Jacob to win this struggle? Verse 25 says, And when he, God, saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And in verse 32, it says, Therefore to this day the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, and the muscle shrank. What exactly did God do? You know that muscle that the Israelites do not eat up to today? The rabbi understood this muscle to be the sinew or what we call the filet mignon, right? And this is a key muscle when it comes to holding the body together, especially when it comes to our walk. Because without it, we can't really walk. When God touched the strongest sinew of the wrestler, it shriveled. And with it, Jacob's persistent self-confidence also shriveled. This is how God won over Jacob. This is how he wins his battle over our stubborn pride. He is, I want to tell you, a very gentle wrestler, but a very persistent one. He's got to win at the end. One against whom we can never win. When God touched this muscle, Jacob went on leaping the rest of his life as a reminder of his reliance on God. His reliance should always be on God. But notice that it's only then that his life began to change. It is only then that God changed his name from Jacob to what? Israel. First time the name Israel appears in the scriptures. This man was to be the father of the nation of God. And this muscle, filet mignon, happened to be the softest one in the body because it has no connective tissues on it. Have you ever eaten a filet mignon and see how soft it is? This may further remind us of our very soft spot that we have. Pride and dependence. 
how good we think we are. The desire is to be independent form. Our creator was meant soft spot from the beginning, from the fruit eaten to the Tower of Babel, of our constant disregard of the cults of God. This thing in us needs to be shriveled so we can, like Mary and like John the Baptist and all the others, allow God to work in our lives. And this man Jacob is mentioned in Luke 133 as representing Israel. More than Abraham from whom many other nations came, Jacob is the sole father of the Jews. But before we leave Genesis 32, there's something really beautiful I want to bring you. There's something that is said about his new mission, which in many ways is connected to his mention in Luke 1, 33. Now consider Genesis 32, verse 38, 31. See what it says. And Jacob called the name of this place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him and he limped on his hip. How come Peniel became Penuel? It's the same place. There's another change of name here. And the rabbis actually noticed this. They saw the, that the word changed from singular, Peniel, Peni, me, I see, to Penuel, we see. Again, in Genesis 30 to 30, the word means I have seen God, while Penuel in Genesis 30 to 31 means I have, we have seen God. We remember that Jacob's task, as his name become Israel, Jacob's task was really to bring the knowledge of God to the nation. He saw God, now the others should see God. He was to train and bring that nation. From him came Israel to Jesus and to us because we also are the new Penuel. We have to bring the word of God to the nation. You have seen God, you have experienced his, his salvific power in you. We need to share it. From Peniel, we became the Penuel itself. And how was this miracle of the virgin birth to happen? Gabriel answers this question in the next verse, verse 35 of Luke 1. It says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called, what? The Son of God. Because the Holy Spirit was, over, was to overshadow Mary, the child would be called the Son of God because the Holy Spirit was to recreate, to create that body so the child is called the Son of God. This, I want to tell you, is also a first in the gospel and there's so much application to this title. We remember that those who are called the sons of God prior to this time were those who were directly created by God such as the angels are called the sons of God in the Old Testament. Now the Messiah is called the son of God because there's a direct creation from God in Mary. But who else later in the New Testament are called the sons of God? You, the believer in Jesus. We are called, but how could that be? How could this be that we be called at the same name as Jesus, son of God? You know, when one received the Messiah in his heart, the Bible says that the Spirit of God comes on him or her and begins the work of changing this person in the likeness of the Messiah. There's recreation there. There's so much that is said about this truth. This is the first encounter with the Spirit. It's called regeneration. You know, when you believe, you are regenerated because the Spirit comes upon you, the same Spirit that came upon Mary to create Jesus. He comes upon you. And as we see in Ephesians 1.13, he says, In him you also trusted. After that, you heard the word of God, the gospel of your salvation in whom you have believed. Then what happens after that you have believed in the word? You are sealed. That's regeneration. Sealed with the spirit of promise. Like with Mary, the spirit comes on every individual. And this time is to recreate in him or her this new nature. And the spirit stays with us. He never leaves us. This we call sanctification, right? So much so that we are even called the temple of the Holy Spirit. But it is the same Spirit that worked in Mary. He works constantly with the believers so that every day, every hour, there must be a change, there must be a progression, a betterment in every one of us. 
See that overshadowing of the Spirit in Mary, while different, yet similar in many ways, is still going on in those that accept Jesus, Yeshua, as their personal Savior, and in all those who believe in His name. Again, the Spirit of God, both in Hebrew and in Greek. What does it mean? Wind. Wind, right? You know, a sailor was once telling a small boy about the sea. He mentioned the wind. What's the wind? Asked the little boy. I don't know what the wind is, replied the sailor, but I know what it does when I raise my sail. We know, we now know a lot how to chart the wind's course, but we still can't see the wind. We can only see what it does. So it is with God's spirit. We can see it, but we can only see what it does in the lives of those who put their trust in God. This is the best testimony you can give to people in this time of Christmas that is coming, in fact. So the winds of God's grace are always blowing, but we must raise the sail of faith if we want them to propel us towards deeper inner peace and joy. Are you prepared to let God take you into union with himself? And pay no more attention to what you call the great things of this world. I'm not talking about your salvation if you're already saved. I'm talking about letting God ride with you. Ride your own life. Are you prepared to abandon entirely and let go? The test of abandonment is in refusing to say like Zachariah, well, what about this and what about that? What about my brother? What about my cousin? Right? This means you have not abandoned. You, you do not really trust God. Immediately, you do abandon. You think no more about what God is going to do. Like Mary said, behold, the maidservant of the Lord, she said in verse 38. Let it be to me according to your word. This is total submission in faith. And this is why we still speak to her about her today, 2,000 years later. And furthermore, as the believer then becomes a son of God, we call this, by the way, the doctrine of adoption, because as he becomes a son of God, he enters the family of God. This is what Galatians 3.26, I want to tell you that because this is so important. For you are all sons of God, he says, through faith in Christ Jesus. And as John brings out this so beautifully in John 1.12, he says, as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become children of God. That's a power, because my father is God, my family is in heaven, my place is in heaven. This is why Jesus was born, so that we may have the power to become sons of God and to enter the family of God. All of this is implying this new title, the Son of God, that Gabriel said. And it's interesting what Gabriel tells Mary before he goes away. See his last words to, to her in verse 36. It says, Now indeed, Elizabeth, your cousin, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month of her who was called barren. What would he give her this information? You know the word grace, charis, you know, is the same word for joy. The information just received, Mary just received about the coming Messiah in her. Who with whom could she have shared this information? How could she keep it to herself when these words, I am sure, were burning in her heart? With whom could she have shared them but with Elizabeth? Because the people around her would not have understood. But Elizabeth had already experienced that miracle. She knew. And so she went. This also reminds me of when someone first comes to believe and his desire to tell the whole world about his newfound Messiah. It is the same kind of joy that Mary could not contain. And by the way, distance was not a hindrance, right? Three days walk from Nazareth to Jerusalem. See that she walked from Nazareth to Jerusalem, but considering the distance and the danger on the road and her age, perhaps her parents played a role. You know, nothing is said about them. But they must have been godly parents. Her knowledge, Mary's knowledge of the word and her faith do reflect her upbringing. What role the parents played? 
we do not know, but surely they must have understood enough to allow and perhaps went with Mary to see Elizabeth because such a young girl and pregnant could not go by herself and walk this road. And Gabriel speaks of Elizabeth as Mary's cousin or relative, which means that they were of the same family. Now, how could uh, Mary be of the same family as Elizabeth if they were of different tribes? That tells us that Jesus had some links with the tribe of Levi. That tells us also that John the Baptist had some links with the tribe of Judah. This is relevant when you consider that at that time, the people looked at these two tribes for the salvation of Israel. For instance, we read in one writing of the time, the Testament of Shimeon, which reflect this belief. This is what it says. It says, be obedient to Levi and Judah. Do not exalt yourself above these two tribes, because from them will arise the Savior come from God. For the Lord will raise up from Levi someone as high priest, and some in Judah, someone king, God, and men, they said. Quite relevant, so Luke reporting this fact may have helped some to see the Messiah. God sent them John the Baptist from Levi and Jesus from the tribe of the Messiah, Judah. Verse 37, 38, close this section. In verse 37 we read, For with God nothing is impossible, of course. Two, pregnancy, that nobody would have thought would happen. Great miracles began to happen in Israel. But really, only two people could really share the joy of these miracles for now. And it's in the next verse where we see Mary and Elizabeth encounter such a great encounter. We don't have time to go through the whole thing. But let's see what we can take from it. By the way, this is an encounter of joy. Let's read verse 39 to 45. It says, Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill countries with haste to a city of Judah. And entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth, verse 41. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Spirit, with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is he, is she who believed. For there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. First, we see in verse 39 that Mary went with haste, right? She ran in order to share her faith. She could not wait to share her experience with the only one really that could understand, fully understand. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, two miracles happened. First, the baby lived in her womb. And second, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. The baby lived in her womb. See that fetuses are alive. Alive so to experience joy. To experience feeling. So when the Messiah entered the room, John the Baptist recognized him. And it seems that this joy... John the Baptist always kept it. Despite his hard life, he never stopped experiencing this joy when he sees the Messiah. For instance, in John 3.29, he says, He who has the bride is the bridegroom, that is Jesus, but the friend of the bridegroom, who is John the Baptist, of course, because he's not part of the church, he's part really of the Old Testament and Old Testament prophet. He said, and who stands and hears them, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Again, he heard his voice, and he rejoiced. He previously rejoiced at Mary's voice, knowing she carried the Messiah. Now he rejoices over Jesus' voice. Again, the joy of the Lord is never-ending. The joy of the Lord is something that nothing really can take away from you. And what is this joy, again, of Mary, Elizabeth, and John the Baptist, what is this joy they experience? How we can attain such a joy? First, we can say that their joy was the result of absolute self-surrender, self-sacrifice to God. It was there. The joy of doing that which the Father had sent them to do. 
Elizabeth and Mary fully believed God and gave their lives to him. As for John, John, that is, do you know what follows the rejoicing? I don't know if I have it here. No. Verse 30 says, right after verse 29, he says, I must increase, uh, no, he must increase, that I must decrease. I would like to stress here the connection between the joy and the surrender. He heard Jesus' voice. He was so joyful and he says, he must increase. I must decrease. Right? Here is the key of real joy. When Mary surrendered to God, she also experienced such great joy that she walked three days in haste. When John the Baptist experienced the joy of the Messiah, he lived, remember? But he surrounded completely to God in that he realized that he has to let God be first. And it is a joy you cannot find anywhere. You may find some measure of happiness, but divine joy only comes when you do the will of God, when you walk according to his precepts. Someone asked, what is the difference between happiness and joy? Big difference, a sea of difference. This is how, by the way, Moody answered this question. I want to bring his answer to you. This is what he said. He says, happiness is caused by things that happen around me and circumstances may mar it, right? This is true because you can buy a new car, you can have a new house. These things can make you happy, but only for a little while. It is not an enduring happiness, but joy is very different. That is the joy of the Lord. This is what Moody said. But joy flows right on through trouble. Joy flows on through the dark. Joy flows in the night as well as in the day. Joy flows through all through persecution and opposition. It is an unceasing fountain bubbling up in the heart. A secret spring the world can't see and doesn't know anything about. The Lord gives his people perpetual joy when they walk in obedience to him. End of quote. The joy of the Lord, real joy, surpasses all of this world's hindrances. It is untouchable. You can have it, actually. In distress, in persecution, our heart knows that God is present at all times and that He is sovereign over the, any situation we're in. And in keeping with this, Paul constantly emphasized the life of the believer with words such as wealth, such as riches, such as abundance. And he prayed that the believer might be filled with all the fullness of God. Imagine, all the fullness of God. I want to tell you, he was not talking about money. He was not talking about physical wealth or health. He was talking about something no one, no circumstances can take away, can take away from you. That is the joy of the Lord. Remember to Nehemiah, God said something quite revealing. I'm really, I'm going to conclude with this in Nehemiah 8 10. You remember Nehemiah, right? He had so much trouble, they wanted to kill him and so on. And God says, Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Do you see here the connection with sorrow and the great struggles that Nehemiah had? These led to joy. Similarly, many times we see some believers being joyful and conclude that this person does not bear the same thing as we do. We think that God richly blessed them with material things perhaps, or other things, so they are not struggling as I am struggling, and so it seems, but I want to ask you to lift the veil and see. The fact that the peace and the light and the joy of God are there is proof that the burden is there too. As someone said, the burden God places squeezes the grapes and come out the wine. Most of us see the wine only, but there was a squeezing song. I want to tell you the circumstances are the same for everyone. We live in the same world. Your problems are everyone's problems. There's nothing unique, I want to tell you that. There is really nothing unique about your problems. So how do you manage your problems? This is the question. Notice the word joy. If the J is for Jesus and the Y is for you, what is the O for? It's for zero. <laughs> Nothing. 
What I'm saying here is the way to stay close to Jesus and keep joy in your heart is to let nothing come between you and God. Nothing. Is there joy in your life regardless of the problems you are fighting? If there is not, it is because you are missing something. Why should you live like this when the Lord is ready to pour on you and your family such great blessings? The text we have seen today tell us that we do not have to miss it anymore. This joy that the Lord gives you is real and you can get it by getting closer to God, by getting to know Him, by surrounding your life like Mary, Elizabeth and John the Baptist. There's lies true happiness. Let's bow ahead in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful. We're so grateful for your choice of these people from whom we can learn so much from. Thank you for Mary. Thank you for John the Baptist, for Zacharias, for Elizabeth, and all this cloud of witness that we have in our scriptures. We are truly blessed by your word that gives us such assurance and strength. And to the Lord, Teach us to praise your name. Teach us to come closer to you. Help us to praise you. Help us to pray. Help us to trust. And may this coming season be a season of praise and progress beyond any we've known so far. May that many come to a saving knowledge of yourself and make that your own will experience the joy, your joy, as we ask in Yeshua's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you all.